He rode in from the West to take the White House in a landslide. Protect and I pledge to you, I'll bring new hope to America. Touching millions with his message. There's no question that President Reagan was among the greatest communicators we've ever seen. A man of rock-solid beliefs. Any more time challenging I leaders you. to change the world. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. With the polish of a Hollywood actor, he could be both charming and disarming. You couldn't be in a room with Ronald Reagan without feeling good. Whether deflecting criticism with humor. I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> or reaching out with compassion to comfort a nation. They prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Even in his own toughest times, he believed in the support of the people and a country of power and pride. America really latched on to him for hope and for optimism and for rebuilding. A man who made a lasting mark. My dream is that you will travel the road ahead with liberty's lamp guiding your steps and opportunity's arm steadying your way. Remembering Ronald Reagan, his life and legacy. Here's Stone Phillips. He was the eternal optimist, a leader determined to convince a nation that it was morning again in America. Ronald Reagan swept into the presidency in a landslide. Through two terms in office, he would survive an assassin's bullet, a few political missteps, and a controversy over arms and hostages to become one of the most popular presidents in modern times. Here's John Hockenberry. We can meet our destiny, and that destiny to build a land here that will be for all mankind a shining city on a hill. Ronald Reagan built his political career the same way he succeeded in Hollywood, by being larger than life promising America his own version of Camelot. To use a big 1980s phrase, Reagan made people feel good about themselves. And no president had really done that since John Kennedy. People yearned for that. Reagan spoke to an America riddled with self-doubt, failed presidents, one-term presidents, a superpower with a stumbling economy at home pushed around overseas. Then, brimming with confidence, Ronald Reagan rode in from the West. I am not frightened by what lies ahead, and I don't believe the American people are frightened by what lies ahead. In eight years, he reshaped America's political landscape and left the White House as one of the most beloved presidents in history. Reagan had enormous leadership quality. It's almost impossible to quantify. But to presidential historian Michael Beschloss, the Reagan years were not just about the power of a personality. Ronald Reagan faced some of the biggest challenges of the century. Whether you love Reagan or hate him, you have to say that this is one of the great, important presidents in American history. The Cold War ended, and Reagan turned American politics toward conservatism in a way that no one else ever had. America is back, standing tall, looking to the 80s with courage, confidence, and hope. The Reagan revolution imagined the unimaginable. When poverty and welfare were at crisis levels in the 1980s, Reagan declared war on government and turned his back on the welfare state. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. The centerpiece of Reagan's domestic policy was an enormous income tax cut. By the mid-1980s, inflation was down and the American economy was humming. Reagan shifted money out of domestic programs and financed the biggest peacetime military buildup in history. He supported armed struggles against communism the world over, from our own backyard in Central America to the far reaches of Asia and Afghanistan. Overseas, at the peak of the Cold War, he was perhaps its toughest general, imagining a world without communism, without a Soviet Union. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. His policies changed history and inflamed critics who claimed he did not grasp the complexity and contradictions in his own positions. But Reagan saw no contradictions. 
His feel for simplicity came from what seemed to be a basic sense of right and wrong, good and evil, and an old-fashioned idea. As a boy, I saw streets filled with Model Ts. As a man, I have met men who walked on the moon. I have not only seen but lived the marvels of what historians have called the American century. Quite simply, Ronald Reagan lived the American dream. He was born in 1911 in the heartland, the younger of two boys. His father, John, struggled against alcohol, and when he could find work, sold shoes. For many years, the Reagans were a rootless family. When they finally settled in Dixon, Illinois, young Dutch started to make a name for himself. He acted in school plays, lettered in football, was president of his class. It's been said young Ronald Reagan didn't let his studies get in the way of a good time. Still, after college, at the height of the Great Depression, with one in three Americans out of work, he rolled the dice with his smooth self-assurance and good looks and came up a winner, first as a sportscaster, then a Hollywood star. Don't worry about that. Goodbye, darling. After World War II, with two young children, Reagan's marriage to actress Jane Wyman ended in divorce. She thought he was boring, and his movie career faded. We think of him now as the charming man who led a charmed life, but the Ronald Reagan story ran much deeper than that. This was a complex person who learned to act at a very early age. If you go home to find your father having drunk and passed out, you learn how to compose yourself at a pretty early age. And Michael Beschlaw says that composure concealed a remoteness that lasted a lifetime. Ronald Reagan was a man of many acquaintances, but few friends. The great irony is that very close underneath this facade of great happiness and optimism was a man who in many ways was very sad and disappointed. Ronald Reagan married his second leading lady, Nancy Davis, in 1952, and this marriage would also produce two children. Nancy Reagan became her husband's best friend, closest advisor, and fiercest protector. There wasn't a love story <laughs> like that one. Michael Deaver was a political aide and confidant of the Reagans for more than 20 years. There were lots of jokes about uh, her staring gaze at Ronald Reagan. But I've always said about Nancy, if Ronald Reagan had owned a shoe store, she'd be pushing shoes. I mean, she was, uh, it was more than a partnership. The marriage transformed the man. In politics, he was transformed as well. The one-time Roosevelt Democrat became a Republican crusader against big government and the Red Menace. The crusade for freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Reagan was elected governor of California in 1966. After two terms, he was proudest of trimming the state's welfare rolls, but is better remembered for the hard line he took against Vietnam War protesters. So help me God. Then in 1980, Ronald Reagan landed the role of a lifetime. The set was Washington, but the script was often Hollywood. I have only one thing to say to the tax increasers. Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> Critics of his arms buildup painted Reagan as a reckless cowboy, a man with his finger on the nuclear button who could crack a joke overheard by a nervous world. We begin bombing in five minutes. The Russians at certain moments in the early 1980s were genuinely worried that Reagan was thinking of a surprise nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. Of course, we know that this is silly, but in the early 1980s, the Soviets didn't always have the best command of what the Americans were doing. Through it all, Ronald Reagan quite literally stuck to his guns. But when the torch was passed to a new generation of Soviet leaders, the staunch anti-communist, the man who just a few years earlier had called the Soviet Union the evil empire cautiously met Mikhail Gorbachev halfway. Dovayai, no provayai. Trust, but verify. <laughs> and whether by chance, by luck, or maybe because Ronald Reagan knew just what he was doing, the arms race was halted and the stage was set for the end of the Cold War and the crumbling of the Soviet empire. Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. At times, Reagan's achievements matched his soaring rhetoric. It would take more than a recession or a James Bond adventure run amok like the Iran-Contra scandal to derail this president. When people said he didn't pay enough attention, that he was asleep at the helm. 
Doing everything we can. Doing everything we can. Reagan could mock himself. As soon as I get home to California, I plan to lean back, kick up my feet, and take a long nap. I'll come to think of it, things won't be all that different after all. But his enduring popularity mocked his critics. Thank you all very much. And in times of crisis, Ronald Reagan projected a rare kind of humanity, warming those he touched, a bond with the American people that was beyond politics. Just two months into his presidency, there was an attempt on his life. He survived with such grace and good humor, like the Gipper, an instant legend. When I saw all those doctors around me, too, I said, I hope they were all Republicans. During World War II, Reagan made movies on the home front. Sergeant McGee, the stage manager of this troop, I order you to report to wardrobe for assignment to ladies of the chorus. What? Over my dead body. But 40 years later, he was at one with the boys who took the beaches at Normandy. We stand on a lonely, windswept point on the northern shore of France. The air is soft, but 40 years ago at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. These are the boys of Point de Hope. Challenger, go at throttle up. And when the loss of the space shuttle Challenger stunned the nation, it was Ronald Reagan's personal touch that provided comfort. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. And perhaps that's how he'll be best remembered, a president who, despite many wrong notes, sounded the right chords at the right moments. Yeah, Ronald Reagan was uh, the kindest person I think I ever knew. What you saw with Reagan was what there was. I simply loved him. In the twilight of his life, as his health slipped away under the weight of Alzheimer's disease, Ronald Reagan demonstrated his grace one last time. In a moving letter written in his own hand, he disclosed his illness to the American people, calling it his journey into the sunset. Nancy called that journey the long goodbye. Over time, the final stages of Alzheimer's even robbed Ronald Reagan, once the most powerful man in the world, of any memory that he had been president. It is probably the worst disease you can ever have because you lose contact and you're not able to share. In our case, you're not able to share all those wonderful memories. And we had a, we had a wonderful life. Whatever else history may say about me when I'm gone, I hope it will record that I appeal to your best hopes, not your worst fears, to your confidence rather than your doubts. My dream is that you will travel the road ahead with liberty's lamp guiding your steps and opportunity's arm steadying your way. Goodbye and God bless each and every one of you and God bless this country we love. For every occasion, he seemed to have a quip, a quote, a story. Ronald Reagan could hold a crowd spellbound, move hearts, even change minds when he spoke. When some would ask, how can an actor be president? He would say, how can you be president if you're not an actor? He knew the value of his Hollywood training, and he made the most of it. Here's Josh Mankiewicz. And he told me on the steps of the Capitol at the time of the inaugural four years ago, he said, Mr. President, I want you to know I will be with you through thick. <laughs> and I said, what about thin? He said, welcome to Washington. <laughs> And what a welcome it was. For eight years, Ronald Wilson Reagan presided over tumultuous times with wit, warmth, and charm. Whether it was invoking the American spirit. These are the men who took the cliffs. And these are the heroes who helped end a war. Poking fun at himself. I knew Thomas Jefferson. 
He was a friend of mine. Or confronting the Soviet Union. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Ronald Reagan knew how to deliver his lines, and he had an innate ability to touch the American soul. There's no question that President Reagan was among the greatest communicators we've ever seen. Raised in Heartland America, Ronald Reagan grew up believing in a Norman Rockwell country of church suppers, town halls, and barber shops. And wherever he spoke, it seemed as if he was trading jokes and stories with a handful of old friends. He was at one with his audience. They would never feel like strangers with him, or they wouldn't feel like this was somebody imposing on them in their living room. Ken Kachigian, once one of Reagan's chief speechwriters, says it all started with the voice. He has one of the most wonderful, soothing voices you could ever imagine. Tomorrow, when mountains greet the dawn, would you go out there and win one for the Gipper? I often describe his voice as being like a fine Merlot being poured into a red wine goblet. And it was a voice nurtured in school dramatics, honed on play-by-play -play radio sportscasts, and trained in Hollywood. I give you my word, I'll shoot the first man who starts for those steps. He moved on to be a commercial pitchman. Right now, let's see what General Electric has done to make your television viewing more... And then a pitchman for conservative politics, culminating in what became known as the speech for the Barry Goldwater campaign. Actually, a government bureau is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. They showed it once nationally, and then they ran it all around the country. Lynn Nofziger began working with Mr. Reagan in 1965 and served him for 20 years. Nofziger says that Goldwater speech turned an actor into a political factor to be dealt with, beginning with the governor's race in California. He went up and down the state for several months uh, making speeches and, and seeing if there was any, any particular desire to have him run. And he decided there was, and so he ran. But it all goes back to the speech. By the time he ran for president 15 years later, Ronald Reagan was still giving a version of the speech with his aw shucks brand of wit and perfect timing. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? Nowhere did his stage presence and poise show better than in this 1980 debate with a one-liner that many credit with assuring him the job as our 40th president. Governor Reagan again, typically, is against such a proposal. Governor? <laughs> there you go again. It was a way of invoking laughter, but it was intended to deflate <laughs> Jimmy Carter, which it did. And there was another trademark picked up in Hollywood. Well, he explained to me that he did that on purpose. That was a, what he called a stage pause. Well. And it was an attention getter. Well. We would write that actually into his speeches. We would start a sentence with, well, dot, 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 and continue. If President Reagan's critics complained of too many tricks, too many studied gestures, the fact is they worked to perfection. Few presidents could do as much with a laugh line. Some things that are current today and sweeping the country that I haven't had time to get uh, familiar with. Pac-Man, for example. I, I don't know about him. Somebody just, I asked about it, and somebody told me that it was a round thing that gobbled up money. I thought that was Tip O'Neill. He joked about the government he led. Where but in Washington would they call the department that's in charge of everything outdoors, everything outside, the Department of Interior? <laughs> But most of all, he joked at his own expense. When Pennsylvania was one of the original 13 states, little did I realize at the time that someday there would be 50. Humor made him not only a tough guy to dislike, it made him a very tough guy to deal with uh, if you were his opposition. Uh, because he could, humor is a very disarming thing. Critics remarked about the president's convenient hearing problems, and Ken Kashigian admits it was just another actor's device. He'd, he'd go like this and act like he couldn't hear. He could almost always hear the questions, I think, that were yelled at him. By the time he ran for re-election in 1984, Ronald Reagan was 73, 
and some said he was showing his age, particularly in the first debate with Walter Mondale. That, um, that the um, uh, deficits, uh, there was nothing wrong with having deficits. But by the time the second debate came around, the old actor knew his lines, and he used them to devastating effect, deflating the very issue that could have cost him the presidency. And I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> the camera went to Mondale. Mondale was laughing hysterically. And here he was, just the brunt of this rapier wit. And he was gone. It was history that, you know, there was never any question anymore. We won in a landslide. Above all, there was something comforting about Ronald Reagan. The way the wind blew his hair. The way he stood tall and strong. Sometimes with a whimsical cock of the head. Sometimes the way he held the podium. Democrats said he was just playing the part of a president. If so, he did it well. He would grab his arms over the edge of the lectern as if to be embracing it. It said, this is not an intimidating presence. This is an open presence. This is a relaxed presence. But Lynn Nofziger says it wasn't just appearances that made the speeches work. It was the ideas that really mattered to the president. One reason he was able to communicate those bedrock principles is because he believed them. And in the 2,765 days of our administration, not one inch of ground has fallen to the communists. If you're trying to sell something you don't believe in, eventually the people catch on. President Reagan was a true believer. He believed in America and Americans. He was optimistic and funny and brave. His America was full of heroes and empty of doubt. Beside that torch that many times before in our nation's history, has cast a golden light in times of gloom. I pledge to you, I'll bring new hope to America. Ronald Wilson Reagan was a surprisingly modest man, but he was also supremely confident. He knew what skills he had and he knew how to use them. And most of all, he knew what he wanted to use them for. I want a nickname, the great communicator. But I never thought it was my style or the words I used that made a difference. It was the content. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. Before he was the nation's 40th president, Ronald Reagan appeared in 53 motion pictures. He was part of Hollywood's golden era, making a name for himself on screen as a matinee idol, then off screen as president of the Screen Actors Guild during the turbulent 50s. It would prove to be a perfect combination to prepare for a career in politics and to run for the country's highest office. Here's Mike Taibbi. If anyone's life seemed like a Hollywood movie, it was Ronald Reagan's. The roles that he played were prophetic. For almost 30 years, Ronald Reagan played Hollywood's version of an average guy, an act that was instinctive and served him well. Next time, call a zoo. All the way to the White House. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. The year was 1937. Dutch Reagan had given up his radio job in Iowa, and like thousands of other strapping young men with good hair, good teeth, and good looks, he went to Hollywood to take his chances. He believed in everything he did. Andrew Saris is a film critic with the New York Observer. There was a kind of Midwestern, all-American, grainy, gritty determination. When young Dutch showed up at the Warner Brothers lot, Hollywood was in its heyday. Actors like Davis, Cagney, Bogart, and Flynn were all big names. They needed something a little catchy for Dutch Reagan. And he said, 
Dutch, Reagan. And I said, my real name is Ronald Reagan. I'd never used the Ronald. I liked Dutch better. And uh, they said, Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Ronald. Hey, that's not bad. I got to keep my own name, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Angie Dickinson was one of Reagan's co-stars. He has the appearance of a very safe, but that's nice, honorable husband and all that. The good cowboy. The Reagan trademarks were a self-deprecating, aw shucks quality, leavened with a sunny optimism. They're safe. Let's go. And a pervading niceness, hey, even when he got the short end of the stick. Tough luck, old man. Here, hold my horse. I think basically Ronald Reagan liked himself. And most actors, they hate themselves. Uh, the great actors usually are trying to get away from who they are. Reagan, I think, wanted to convince you that who he was was somebody really uh, sincere, very nice. And, um, and, and this, this, I think, limits you, the roles you can play. Reagan may have been a limited actor, but his perseverance and warmth kept him busy in Hollywood. He is the most pleasant lovely person you can imagine being right. The studio packaged Reagan's all-American niceness in the light-hearted escapist fare that was popular during the Depression. But as World War II loomed, Warner Brothers began delivering a political message. A lot of their films really had a very strong patriotic uh, flavor to them in the 1930s. Stephen Vaughn, who has written about Reagan's Hollywood years, says Reagan was probably seen in uniform more times than any other president, except for Eisenhower. The intention of the Warners was yes, uh, they were interested in military preparedness and this was the best way they knew how to call attention to that effect by putting attractive young men in, in uniform and showing them doing courageous uh, and exciting things. At about this time, Reagan appeared as a military cadet in Brother Rat, where he met actress Jane Wyman. It was the perfect Hollywood love story, a romance on and off the screen. Their marriage gave his career a boost, his first big role in Newt Rockney All-American. He was in the big leagues now, making Santa Fe Trail with Errol Flynn. Are you in love with him and not with me? And he was the lead in King's Row, his best dramatic role. We were going to run away. She'd been getting out to meet me for a long time. Do I need to say anything more? Did Dr. Tower know anything about this? I guess I wouldn't be here today if he had. Reagan and his co-star in King's Row, Ann Sheridan, so lit up the screen that it was rumored some people at Warner's even considered them for the lead roles in Casablanca. It could have been the beginning of a beautiful career, but Bogart and Bergman got Casablanca. Reagan and Sheridan got Juke Girl. You didn't think I was going to let you beat it out of town? I suppose you want to put a flower in my hair and marry me. Why not? The vagaries of cinema history. When America got involved in World War II, everything changed. While American troops went abroad, Reagan was deployed to a Hollywood suburb, making films for the Army, his career on hold. Oh, you look wonderful in that uniform. Not any better than the rest of us. We all have the same tailor. I think the war, in many ways, was a catalyst. There's a seriousness that begins to come into a lot of his thinking that was not there before. After the war, Reagan and Jane Wyman divorced. He became more involved in the Screen Actors Guild and spoke out against communism. Backbenched at Warner's, Reagan branched out into B-movies at other studios, from tough westerns to campy kids' films. What if I could teach this monkey the difference between right and wrong? Many of Reagan's political rivals would tease him for appearing with a chimp but some film critics say that Reagan performed with commendable skill and composure. I think that his good nature comes through in, in, in coping with this situation. I don't think you'd win an Oscar for that, but uh, maybe a Purple Heart. Film critic Jim Hoberman says Bonzo was a kind of unconscious masterstroke. He was always underestimated by uh, rival politicians. They, never, they thought because he had uh, been in something as ridiculous as Bedtime for Bonzo that, that he wasn't going to be able to get on TV, deliver a speech, and, and knock them out of the water. How wrong they were. Hollywood, it turned out, was a perfect political training ground, first through his presidency of the Screen Actors Guild. I think Hollywood is really uh, the, where Reagan's political apprenticeship uh, began. It was a place where people talked politics, they debated politics, they divided over issues. As for his film career, 
There were just a couple of acts left in the Reagan saga. One, a role he never wanted, an out-of-character tough guy in The Killers, originally made for TV. This was an out-and-out -out bad guy, and he does not fit that role at all. You get back to the hotel and stay there. I like it here. Does this so guy even look that, like Ronald Reagan? He sure doesn't act like him. Every time I saw him when he was president, he, he never failed to say, I'm so glad I didn't really have to hit you. The other part left in his fading film career turned out in a strange way to be the role of a lifetime, Hellcats of the Navy, the return of the real Reagan. No president could ever salute like Reagan, not even the ones with active military backgrounds. And no president ever romanced his wife, make that wives, on the screen. Wife number two, Nancy Davis. It won't stay settled, Kate. Time to go from the movies to find something else. There's a famous story that when he announced his candidacy for governor of California, his former boss, Jack Warner, said, no, 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 no. Jimmy Stewart for governor, Ronald Reagan for best friend. Because those were the parts that he played. Once again, they underestimated the aw shucks kid from Dixon. He would ride off into the sunset, and governor wouldn't be his last stop. He may have held the most powerful position in the world, yet Ronald Reagan had a rare ability to put people at ease, a formidable asset, whether he was dealing with the public or a political opponent. He brought the relaxed approach he showed around his ranch to the formal rooms of the White House, and there was a different feel at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue from the moment he strode through the door. Here's Andrea Mitchell. With that, I think I'll have to get up and do what the little nine-year-old girl wrote me in a letter, which she said, now get to the Oval Office and get to work. <laughs> <laughs> he was warm and casual, <laughs> passing around jelly beans at important meetings, joking with aides. Now is it all right if I go get a drink of water? It isn't on the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> he had an anecdote for every occasion. One of the stories we're leaving here about families, the little boy and his I asked him how many brothers and sisters he had, and he said 11. And he said, my, that must be very expensive. And the little boy says, no, we don't buy them, we raise them. <laughs> People just like to be around Ronald Reagan. We all wanted to be part of the Reagan team. He was a winner. He made people feel good. You couldn't be in a room with Ronald Reagan without feeling good. And he was so decent to everybody all the time. Walk up and down the halls in the White House. He, He'd never remember her name, of course, but he was so warm in uh, greeting everybody. He just made them feel good. Former Senator Paul Laxalt, perhaps Ronald Reagan's closest confidant. He ran his presidential campaigns and remembers congratulating Reagan on his new job. I said, uh, Ron, do I have to uh, call you Mr. President now? He said, only in the presence of others. He said it in such a cute fashion that led me to believe that this fellow wasn't going to be changed at all by that White House, which has happened too often in this town. <laughs> Ronald Reagan ran against Washington. In fact, never caught Potomac fever. Laxalt had the job of introducing the new president to the ways of the Capitol, acting as a bridge between Reagan and the real politicians in Congress. Ron Reagan uh, was always very uncomfortable around politicians, per se. He just wasn't at ease uh, in the situation. Uh, he was basically a Hollywood man. And the kind of man who'd take time to feed the White House squirrels. Old-fashioned, says former Chief of Staff James Baker. Some people say that he was a naive person. And in some respects, he was. You know, he would sit down in the uh, Oval Office and he would write out in longhand on a yellow pad every letter that he personally wanted to write to someone. That's not something people generally do these days. Reagan simply didn't care about the mechanics of government or politics. He was guided by a personal philosophy, a set of firmly held fundamental beliefs. He had an inner compass. He didn't look at the polls. He didn't care what the polls said. He knew what he believed in and where he wanted to take the country. I don't think uh, in recorded history that we've ever had a president who was as apolitical as Ronald Reagan. Not really interested in the process, not really interested in the mechanism or the personalities or the leaders or the big shots. Critics said he was short-sighted and removed, but Ronald Reagan was a big picture man, a visionary, his staff said, 
who communicated his ideas well and left details to others. But I'd like to hear your comments and your input now on what you'd suggest. Ken Duberstein served as Reagan's last chief of staff. He was not a hands-on manager. That's why the chiefs of staff were there. He was a primary color president. He wasn't the pastels. One of his great strengths as an executive was that he was secure enough that he delegated. And I said, how in the world can you do that? He said, I just find good people. I turn it over to them. And it's, that ball is in their court. When it comes time for options to be presented to me, I trust those options, but I call the shots. He brought a more relaxed approach to the White House, working banker's hours. He set the prime example. Come five or six in the afternoon, unless there was something heavy, he was gone. But when it came to communicating his vision, Ronald Reagan trusted his gut instincts. In the midst of heated negotiations with the former Soviet Union, Duberstein remembers a turning point involving the president, Mr. Gorbachev, and a baseball. Reagan took the baseball, walked into the study, and explain the American idiom, do you want to play ball? And by taking the ball and throwing it up in the air, asked Gorbachev whether or not they wanted to play ball or do you want to stay on rigid ideological positions? And Gorbachev said, let's play ball. His advisors say that the genial, self-deprecating president was a master at negotiation. No one knew that better than the late Democratic Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. No hard feelings, old pal. It's a great two-party system we have. We gave our best and uh, you outdid us. Tip O'Neill used to say, I don't like compromising with Ronald Reagan because every time I compromise with Ronald Reagan, Reagan gets 80% of what he wants. And Reagan would just sit there and smile. And that was his way of governing, standing firm, moving the consensus in his direction, and then ultimately winning. Trent, I just calling again. I wanted to, before any more time went by, thank you very much for what you did in our recent go round up there. I and when Ronald Reagan same. worked the phones to line up votes, he could be irresistible. He might not remember a congressman's name, but he could sure turn on the charm. And as for the, the press, you. You still make, you still make a mistake, Mr. President. Hold it. Assigned to report and analyze and criticize. No, and I'm not taking any more questions. And the vast majority of the press corps, the media, really didn't relate to Ronald Reagan's agenda, but they really couldn't find a way to dislike him as a person, and they didn't. They loved him as a person. He avoided confrontation, found it almost impossible to fire someone. He's a very kindly man, tender-hearted. He was a wuss in a lot of, uh, you know, in the good sense of the word. He had a terrible time getting rid of people and uh, actually usually didn't. That was usually delegated. President Reagan believed firmly in loyalty up, loyalty down. Where the press would be uh, beating up on somebody, he would say to us, politically it might be uh, the best thing to do, but he said, I don't believe in throwing babies off the sled to feed the wolves. But you're not denying, sir, that there will be any changes in your staff. I'm not commenting either way, I'm just... Even after the Iran-Contra scandal, Reagan couldn't bear to tell the man most of Washington blamed, Chief of Staff Don Regan, that it was time to go. The time had come to cut the cord, and Ron could no more bring Don Regan and say, you know, I love you, but uh, you become an issue, and when you, a person becomes an issue, it's time to walk. He couldn't do that. George had to do it. At his farewell staff meeting in January 1989, Ronald and Nancy Reagan were sentimental. There just aren't any, aren't enough words to, to thank you for all that you've meant to all of us and how hard it is to say goodbye. Alain said I should say something, but I'll never get through it. <laughs> And when it came time to leave center stage, Reagan displayed the same good cheer and confidence he had when he first came to Washington, looking forward to going home to his beloved ranch, satisfied that he'd left a permanent legacy, 
the end of the Cold War, a revival of national good feeling and pride. Ken Duberstein rode back to California with the former president and first lady. When we walked through the Capitol on a cold, cold day, we got on the helicopter and we lifted off to the Capitol and we did that ceremonial fly around Washington. And over the White House, he leaned over and tapped Mrs. Reagan on her knee and said, look, Nancy, there's our little bungalow. That's vintage Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan, and everybody teared up. And so, goodbye, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. It was a next to final scene that would probably have pleased the showman in Ronald Reagan who liked good pageantry. The solemn but splendid cathedral rituals. The state both in high mourning and celebrating with thanks a public life well lived. I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public life. The four living ex-presidents sat together in the first pews. The Cold Warriors, Margaret Thatcher, the greatest ally, sitting side by side with Gorbachev, the one-time greatest foe. Amazing grace. But the dignitary-packed funeral alone didn't capture the spirit of the week gone by. Maybe the country surprised itself in its outpouring of affection for a passing long anticipated. In Simi Valley, California, more than 100,000 people driving for hours, waiting even more just to file past the flag-draped casket, adding to the shrine their mementos, their jelly beans, leaving personal messages in condolence books. Thuy Mai escaped from Vietnam as a child. The Reagans personally intervened to reunite her with her family. My greatest respect and regard to you. You have made a difference in my life. You have defined America to me. In the end, gone for 10 years, he achieved a patina that transcended partisan politics. One of his lasting legacies is that, that just as a leader, he was able to get everybody to bring out the best of all of us. Americans simply wanted to thank him for making them feel good about themselves and their country. In Washington, D.C., when the riderless horse went by, when the cannons fired their salute, out in the crowd lining the sidewalk 10 deep were the gold farms who'd driven 12 hours from Jacksonville, Florida, just to be part of the moment. See Nancy Reagan in the back seat? Yeah. The two younger daughters named Ronnie and Reagan. Let us pray. For two nights and a day, he lay under the great dome where Lincoln and Kennedy had rested. Americans by the tens of thousands saying goodbye. At a time when we're famished to feel misty-eyed and united about something. About an old-fashioned love story. Fresh admiration for her devotion and care. 
Soft focus memories of a cheerful, self-deprecating man and God bless the United who talked States kindly to us and tough to the Russians. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And it was an appealing biography. A boy from not much, son of a shoe salesman in a small prairie town. In that hometown, Dixon, Illinois, some thought he took their spirit with him on his journey. People felt appreciated in Dixon because he appreciated Dixon. Oh, that's him. Oh, right, yeah. He went to Hollywood and did okay, but even better when his show business career okay. faded and he turned his flair for motivational speaking into elective politics. A president who did so well by always hitting his mark and delivering the applause line with punch. You ain't seen nothing yet. Now leaves us with more snapshots in the pages of our national memory book. In March of 2002, the Reagans celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Because of the president's Alzheimer's, it was a bittersweet time. Still, Mrs. Reagan talked with Katie Couric about her five decades of memory. When you think about our lives, it's been extraordinary. The different paths that we've gone on that we never intended to go on. It's really wonderful. You'll be celebrating your 50th anniversary on I March know. 4th. Do you think, where did the time go? I, I know, can't believe I it. I know, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. But isn't it wonderful? I mean, 50 years. And That's this, a long time. <laughs> and in this day and age, when you hear the statistics yeah. about 50% uh, of all marriages end in divorce, it really is quite an accomplishment, isn't it? I guess so. But then, <laughs> you know, I... I think I was born to be married. Really? <laughs> I think I was born married. I was the happiest girl in the world when I became we. I, you know, I, I loved that. I loved everything about marriage. You have said in the past that your life began when you met Ronald Reagan. It did. Everybody made fun of me, but... <laughs> they did? Why did they make fun of you? I don't know. It sounds kind of square, I guess. Kind but... of sappy? Yeah. I think it sounds really sweet. For all those years of love and devotion, Mrs. Reagan is left with a lifetime of memories she can no longer share and now must treasure alone. You know, I... I think 50 years, and it's very hard to pick one moment or, or the other that stands out. But we've had a great life, a great life. And I was very blessed to find him. I really was. And he you, you think? And he, yes. <laughs> Not only anniversaries, but every holiday was a special time for the Reagans. They celebrated each one with cards and letters. Ronnie and I both would exchange a dozen cards, number one. And he, Ronnie is a very sentimental man, very romantic man. On my birthday, he would send flowers to my mother, thanking her for having me. Aww. Now, you know, that's pretty nice. Yeah, I'll say. That, that was a real... Yeah. Mother-in-law pleaser, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that said, must have earned him a lot of points. <laughs> he said that after he met my mother, that he had to throw away all his mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> Ronald Reagan has been called the great communicator. He kept a journal, jotting down even the simplest thoughts on a daily basis. Entries like this one written in the White House in 1981. Wednesday, March the 4th, our wedding anniversary. 29 years of more happiness than any man could rightly deserve. To have someone write that after 29 years of marriage is pretty I know. darn impressive, huh? I know. I know. Wasn't I lucky, Kate? You were. I know. <laughs> You've said in the past, mainly you have to be willing to want to give. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, I think in a marriage, sometimes 
sometimes you give, it's never 50-50. You know, sometimes you give 90 and the other one gives 10 or vice versa. It, it changes and you have to be willing to do that. It was never a problem with me <laughs> or with him. What was it that attracted you to him? Oh, he was unlike any actor I had ever met. Never talked about himself or his next picture or his last picture, ever. What did he talk about? He talked about the Civil War. He talked about horses. Uh, but he never talked about himself, ever, ever. That must have been terribly refreshing. Oh, yeah, you bet. <laughs> Nancy Davis and Ronald Reagan were married at the Little Brown Church in Studio City, California on March 4, 1952. The early days were a challenge. They had to quickly learn to function as a blended family. President Reagan already had two children from his previous marriage to actress Jane Wyman. I think for any woman, it's hard to step into that position because you want the children to like you, and they want to like you, and there's... But you they know, may not like they, you. But they may not. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. Vice versa. But we, I mean, we had chances to get to know each other, and so it worked out fine. As with any relationship, it took work, and the Reagans had their fair share of struggles. We certainly did have obstacles. You know, there was a period when Ronnie had left the studio and it was a very dry period and financially we were not in good shape. Through the years they weathered the storm and the enduring image of the Reagans is of one of the most devoted political couples in history. But their later years have been marked by sadness. First, President Reagan's diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and then the death of his daughter, Maureen, who lost her battle with melanoma this past summer. It's so unnatural. A child isn't supposed to go before the parent. It's just, it's not supposed to be that way. And I remember flying to Sacramento for the funeral and thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm making this trip. I, I really can't. But she was one courageous, gutsy she woman, wasn't was. she? She certainly was. Yes, she was. And she had a wonderful husband who never left her side. As painful as Maureen's death was and, and her illness prior to it, in some ways, I understand it, it brought your family closer together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. It did. Yeah. You get down to what's really important in life. Much has been written about the tempestuous relationship between the Reagans and their children. Recently, Patty Davis has reconciled with her mother, and now she has become a regular presence in her parents' lives. Obviously, it's made me very happy, and I think it's made her happy, too. I know it's made her happy, too. Um, because She's experiencing a chapter in his, in his life now that's very meaningful, certainly very different, but she's part of it. So Nancy Reagan will share the memories of 50 years of marriage with her daughter at her side. Will you be able to celebrate in some small way, you think? I know it's hard. No. Inside, yes, but there's no way to celebrate. But I can celebrate the fact that we've had 50 years, which still, I can't believe it. In a book called, I Love You, Ronnie, Nancy Reagan shared love letters sent by her husband. In September of 2000, she read some of those for NBC News and journeyed back in time to the way her life with Ronald Reagan used to be.
This letter was written from the White House on March 4th, 1981. Dear First Lady, as President of the United States, it's my honor and privilege to cite you for service above and beyond the call of duty and that you have made one man, me, the most happy man in the world for 29 years. That's Nancy Reagan reading a letter Ronald Reagan wrote her in 1981 on their 29th wedding anniversary, their first in the White House. She kept that note just as she kept the hundreds of others he wrote her through the years. Ronald Reagan and Nancy Davis met on a blind date of sorts, choreographed by a Hollywood producer. They went to see Mae West. <laughs> and they were out late, and then I guess they just couldn't wait for the next date. It was just... I think it probably uh, was uh, almost love at first sight. He took one look at her, and she took one look at him, uh, and uh, it was love. Love, love. Ronald Reagan's letter-writing campaign to Nancy began almost as soon as they met. It was the early 1950s, and Reagan was busy with his first career, making movies. He wrote this letter to Nancy while filming a movie in Arizona. We asked actor Hal Linden to read it for us. Just a quick line from somewhere south of Tucson, pronounced Tucson. I know why the Confederates lost. They were so damn hot in these uniforms, they couldn't fight. There goes the bugle. Farewell. It didn't take long for the couple to become the buzz of Hollywood. Everybody talked about their love affair, that, and I think a lot of it was with envy. Wednesday, July 15th, 1953. Dear Nancy Pants, I suppose some people would find it unusual that you and I can so easily span 3,000 miles, but in truth, it comes very naturally. Man can't live without a heart, and you are my heart. I love you. The eastern half of us. Nancy Davis and Ronald Reagan were married on March 4, 1952. The quiet ceremony was the beginning of a long, loving life together. The first... Uh ingredient is love for one another and I think uh, that was uh, present from the very beginning. Truth is the early years were difficult. Reagan frequently traveled. Movie roles and TV programs took him on the road. He wrote his new bride from lonely hotel rooms across the country. Sunday March 20th 1955. My darling, it's time to move on to the next town now, and every move is a step toward home and you. I love you very much, and I don't even mind that life made me wait so long to find you. The waiting only made the finding sweeter. When you get this, we will be almost halfway through the lonely stretch. I love you, Ronnie. In 1954, Reagan accepted a job as host of the new television drama the General Electric Theater. In addition to his TV appearances, he toured the country as the company's corporate ambassador, visiting GE plants and talking to employees. Again, the intense travel schedule kept the newlyweds apart. March 7th, 1955. Dear Nancy, going wrong way, but still it is one day nearer. I love you, Ronnie. In 1957, they co-starred in their only film together, Hellcats of the Navy. I thought we settled all that about you and me. It won't stay settled, kids. Not until you tell me you stopped caring. They weren't tempted by Hollywood fame at all. Nancy wasn't looking at guys and he wasn't looking at girls at a party. They were looking at each other. Holidays were always marked with a special letter or card like this one. He started calling Nancy Mommy after their daughter Patty was born. February 14th, 1960. Darling Mommy Poo. February 14th may be the date they observe and call Valentine's Day, but that is for people of only ordinary luck. I happen to have a Valentine's life, 
which started on March 4th, 1952, and will continue as long as I have you. I love you very much, Papa. I was immediately struck by the closeness of the couple. Sometimes at dinner, uh, she would reach across the dinner table and hold his hand. Ronald Reagan has one best friend, and he married her. March 4th, 1963. My darling, this is really just an in-between day. It is a day on which I love you 365 days more than I did a year ago, and 365 less than I will a year from now. All my love, your husband. Much of their time together was spent at the ranch outside Santa Barbara. As a former cavalryman, Ronald Reagan was a huge fan of horses, and his wife quickly developed the same affection. He'd go horseback riding, she'd go horseback riding with him, but then he'd go chopping wood. That ranch was the savior of everything, and every day those lovely walks, the two of them together, you'd see them off together. And, uh, a marriage made in heaven. It endures today, half a century later, the 40th President of the United States in failing health, but his Nancy still by his side. This new book, his love letters to her, handpicked by her, her love letter back to him. Her love still so strong, it's too hard for her to read them in front of anyone else. But that 1981 letter, the one he wrote her on their 29th anniversary, just after they'd moved into the White House, that one was special, the only one she can bring herself to read. Dear First Lady, as President of the United States, it's my honor and privilege to cite you for service above and beyond the call of duty in that you have made one man, me, the most happy man in the world for 29 years. Nancy Davis then went on to bring him happiness for the next 29 years as Nancy Davis Reagan, for which she has received and will continue to receive his undying devotion forever and ever. She's done this in spite of the fact that he still can't find the words to tell her how lost he would be without her. He sits in the Oval Office from which he can see, if he scrooches down, her window and feels warm all over just knowing she's there. The above is the statement of the man who benefited from her act of heroism. The below is his signature, Ronald Reagan, President of the United States. P.S. He, I mean I, love and adore you. To my wife on Christmas Day. It's amazing what that four-letter word wife covers when it's applied to you. It means a companion without whom I'm never quite complete or happy. I live in a perpetual warm glow because of you. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for being my wife. Ronald Reagan wrote that letter to his wife in 1978. Nancy Reagan says she kept it with all the other letters in a shopping bag. As she was preparing to donate them to the Reagan Library, she sat down to read them, and in a foreword in the new book writes, I was struck by how much they said about him, not just as a president, but as a man, and about us, the love we shared. The letters took me back in time. For instance, to 1966. Dear little mommy, I have to write this because of all our talks about flying and because you'd try to take the blame personally if ever something did happen. God has a plan and it isn't for us to understand. I looked over the first time I flew with him and he was saying a prayer. And I said, are you praying the plane doesn't crash? He said, oh no. He said, I'm praying if it does crash, he'll take care of Nancy. The Reagans celebrated their 19th wedding anniversary during his second term as governor of California. March 4th, 1971. Dear Mrs. Reagan, there are no words to describe the happiness you have brought to the Gov. By his own admission, he is completely in love with you and happier than ever a Gov deserves. With love and appreciation, your in love, Gov. Her devotion to him and his devotion to her was, uh, was remarkable. They were absolutely perfect together. 
If Ronnie owned a shoe store like his dad, Nancy had been pushing shoes. I mean, that's just the way it was. December 1980, Ronnie wrote this letter to Nancy on Christmas Day, the last holiday before they moved to Washington. My beloved First Lady, I have this problem. I miss you when you first leave the room. I worry about you when you go out the front door. Without you, there would be no sun, no moon, no stars. With you, they are all out at the same time. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. Becoming president didn't change his pension for letter writing. On her birthday, the president would slip out of the White House somehow with an aide and go to a card shop and buy maybe 20 or 30 cards, birthday cards, and plant them all over the White House for her to find. Nearly three months after taking office, the assassination attempt, a brush with death that would forever change their lives. When he was shot, she said, you've got to get me in there because um, they don't know about us, what it's like with us. She was always very protective of him. But after the shooting, she became more so. And I think she was very concerned about where he went, what appointments he had outside of the White House. Dear First Mummy, I'm in Wyoming, Montana, or Nevada, depending on what time you read this. Now, I don't want this to come as a shock to you, but, well, well, I'll just come right out with it. I'm in love with you. There, I've said it, and I'm glad. First Papa. While in Washington, the couple tried to keep their affection for each other private. Only their closest friends knew the depth of their devotion. It was the constant hidden hand-holding that we all knew and never remarked on. When he'd walk from uh, the living quarters to the West Wing, uh, uh, if, there were, if there was any reason for her to go to the Oval Office, they would hold hands uh, walking by the Rose Garden. If they were in the car together or if they were walking into the back of the stage or something like that, they would, you would see that a great affection. Today, life is very different for the Reagans. Alzheimer's has stolen his memory. In this new book, Mrs. Reagan writes, there are so many memories that I can no longer share, which makes it very difficult. When it comes right down to it, you're in it alone. Each day is different. You get up, put one foot in front of the other, and go. And love, just love. Alzheimer's, she says, is truly a long, long goodbye but she also says it's the living out of love. Their love has lasted more than 50 years. She read one of his letters for us, a reminder of the way their life together began. Dear First Lady, beginning in 1951, Nancy Davis, seeing the plight of a lonely man who didn't know how lonely he really was, determined to rescue him from a completely empty life. Refusing to be rebuffed by a certain amount of stupidity on his part, she ignored his somewhat slow response. With patience and tenderness, she gradually brought the light of understanding to his darkened, obtuse mind, and he discovered the joy of loving someone with all his heart. With the Soviet Union then being led by reformer Mikhail Gorbachev, President Reagan traveled to West Berlin on June 12, 1987, and challenged Gorbachev to take a dramatic step toward ending the Cold War. The president's remarks were delivered to a crowd on the west side of the Brandenburg Gate and the Berlin Wall, but could be heard by people gathered on the other side too. Thank you very much. Chancellor Kohl, Governing Mayor Diepken, ladies and gentlemen, 24 years ago, President John F. Kennedy visited Berlin. And speaking to the people of this city and the world at the City Hall, well, since then, two other presidents have come, each in his turn to Berlin. And today, I myself make my second visit to your city. Uh, 
We come to Berlin, we American presidents, because it's our duty to speak in this place of freedom. But I must confess, we're drawn here by other things as well, by the feeling of history in this city, more than 500 years older than our own nation, by the beauty of the Grunwald and the Tiergarten, most of all, by your courage and determination. Perhaps the composer Paul Linke understood something about American presidents. You see, like so many presidents before me, I come here today because wherever I go, whatever I do, ich hab noch keinen Koffer in Berlin. Our gathering today is being broadcast throughout Western Europe and North America. I understand that it is being seen and heard as well in the East. To those listening throughout Eastern Europe, I extend my warmest greetings and the goodwill of the American people. To those listening in East Berlin, a special word. Although I cannot be with you, I address my remarks to you just as surely as to those standing here before me. For I join you as I join your fellow countrymen in the West in this firm, this unalterable belief, Es gibt nur ein Berlin. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic south, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wire, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Farther south, there may be no visible, no obvious wall, but there remain armed guards and checkpoints all the same. Still a restriction on the right to travel. Still an instrument to impose upon ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state. Yet it is here in Berlin where the wall emerges most clearly. Here, cutting across your city, where the news photo and the television screen have imprinted this brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner forced to look upon a scar. President von Weizsäcker has said the German question is open as long as the Brandenburg Gate is closed. But today, today I say as long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. <laughs> Yet, I do not come here to lament, for I find in Berlin a message of hope, even in the shadow of this wall, a message of triumph. In this season of spring in 1945, the people of Berlin emerged from their air raid shelters to find devastation. Thousands of miles away, the people of the United States reached out to help. And in 1947, Secretary of State, as you've been told, George Marshall, announced the creation of what would become known as the Marshall Plan. Speaking precisely 40 years ago this month, he said, our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos.
In the Reichstag a few moments ago, I saw a display commemorating this 40th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. I was struck by a sign, the sign on a burnt out gutted structure that was being rebuilt. I understand that Berliners of my own generation can remember seeing signs like it dotted throughout the western sectors of the city. The sign read simply, the Marshall Plan is helping here to strengthen the free world. A strong free world in the West, that dream became real. Japan rose from ruin to become an economic giant. Italy, France, Belgium, virtually every nation in Western Europe saw political and economic rebirth. The European community was founded. In West Germany and here in Berlin, there took place an economic miracle. The Wirtschaftswandir. Adenauer, Erhardt, Reuter, and other leaders understood the practical importance of liberty, that just as truth can flourish only when the journalist is given freedom of speech, so prosperity can come about only when the farmer and businessmen enjoy economic freedom. The German leaders, the German leaders reduced tariffs, expanded free trade, lowered taxes. From 1950 to 1960 alone, the standard of living in West Germany and Berlin doubled. Where four decades ago there was rubble, today in West Berlin there is the greatest industrial output of any city in Germany. Busy office blocks, fine homes and apartments, proud avenues and the spreading lawns of parkland. Where a city's culture seemed to have been destroyed, today there are two great universities, orchestras and an opera, countless theaters and museums. Where there was want, today there's abundance, food, clothing, automobiles, the wonderful goods of the Kudam. From devastation, from utter ruin, you Berliners have in freedom rebuilt a city that once again ranks as one of the greatest on earth. And the Soviets may have had other plans, but my friends, there were a few things the Soviets didn't count on. Berliner Herz, Berliner Humor, Ja und Berliner Schnauzer. <laughs> in the 1950s, in the 1950s, Khrushchev predicted, we will bury you. But in the West today, we see a free world that has achieved a level of prosperity and well-being unprecedented in all human history. In the communist world, we see failure, technological backwardness, declining standards of health, even want of the most basic kind, too little food. Even today, the Soviet Union still cannot feed itself. After these four decades, then, there stands before the entire world one great and inescapable conclusion. Freedom leads to prosperity. Freedom replaces the ancient hatreds among nations with comity and peace. Freedom is the victor. And now, now the Soviets themselves may in a limited way be coming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Some political prisoners have been released. Certain foreign news broadcasts are no longer being jammed. Some economic enterprises have been permitted to operate with greater freedom from state control. Are these the beginnings of profound changes in the Soviet state, or are they token gestures 
intended to raise false hopes in the West or to strengthen the Soviet system without changing it. We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty, the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I understand the fear of war and the pain of division that afflict this continent. And I pledge to you my country's efforts to help overcome these burdens. To be sure, we in the West must resist Soviet expansion. So we must maintain defenses of unassailable strength. Yet we seek peace, so we must strive to reduce arms on both sides. Beginning 10 years ago, the Soviets challenged the Western alliance with a grave new threat. Hundreds of new and more deadly SS-20 nuclear missiles capable of striking every capital in Europe. The Western Alliance responded by committing itself to a counter-deployment. Unless the Soviets agreed to negotiate a better solution, namely the elimination of such weapons on both sides, for many months the Soviets refused to bargain in earnestness. As the Alliance, in turn, prepared to go forward with its counter-deployment, there were difficult days, days of protests, like those during my 1982 visit to this city. And the Soviets later walked away from the table. But through it all, the Alliance held firm. And I invite those who protested then, I invite those who protest today, to mark this fact, because we remain strong, the Soviets came back to the table. <laughs> because we remain strong today, we have within reach the possibility not merely of limiting the growth of arms, but of eliminating for the first time an entire class of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. As I speak, NATO ministers are meeting in Iceland to review the progress of our proposals for eliminating these weapons. At the talks in Geneva, we have also proposed deep cuts in strategic offensive weapons. And the Western allies have likewise made far-reaching proposals to reduce the danger of conventional war and to place a total ban on chemical weapons. While we pursue these arms reductions, I pledge to you that we will maintain the capacity to deter Soviet aggression at any level at which it might occur. And in cooperation with many of our allies, the United States is pursuing the Strategic Defense Initiative, research to base deterrence not on the threat of offensive retaliation, but on defenses that truly defend, on systems, in short, that will not target populations, but shield them. 
By these means, we seek to increase the safety of Europe and all the world. But we must remember a crucial fact. East and West do not mistrust each other because we're armed. We're armed because we mistrust each other. And our differences are not about weapons, but about liberty. When President Kennedy spoke at the City Hall those 24 years ago, freedom was encircled. Berlin was under siege. And today, despite all the pressures upon this city, Berlin stands secure in its liberty, and freedom itself is transforming the globe. In the Philippines, in South and Central America, democracy has been given a rebirth. Throughout the Pacific, free markets are working miracle after miracle of economic growth. In the industrialized nations, a technological revolution is taking place, a revolution marked by rapid, dramatic advances in computers and telecommunications. In Europe, only one nation and those it controls refuse to join the community of freedom. Yet in this age of redoubled economic growth, of information and innovation, the Soviet Union faces a choice. It must make fundamental changes or it will become obsolete. Today thus represents a moment of hope. We in the West stand ready to cooperate with the East to promote true openness, to break down barriers that separate people, to create a safer, freer world. And surely there is no better place than Berlin, the meeting place of East and West, to make a start. Free people of Berlin today as in the past, the United States stands for the strict observance and full implementation of all parts of the Four Power Agreement of 1971. Let us use this occasion, the 750th anniversary of this city, to usher in a new era, to seek a still fuller, richer life for the Berlin of the future. Together, let us maintain and develop the ties between the Federal Republic and the Western sectors of Berlin, which is permitted by the 1971 agreement. And I invite Mr. Gorbachev, let us work to bring the Eastern and Western parts of the city closer together so that all the inhabitants of all Berlin can enjoy the benefits that come with life in one of the great cities of the world. To open Berlin still further to all Europe, East and West, let us expand the vital air access to this city, finding ways of making commercial air service to Berlin more convenient, more comfortable and more economical. We look to the day when West Berlin can become one of the chief aviation hubs in all Central Europe. With, with our French with our French and British partners, the United States is prepared to help bring international meetings to Berlin. It would be only fitting for Berlin to serve as the site of United Nations meetings or world conferences on human rights and arms control or other issues that call for international cooperation. There is no better way to establish hope for the future than to enlighten young minds. And we would be honored to sponsor summer youth exchanges, cultural events, and other programs for young Berliners from the East. Our French and British friends, I'm certain, will do the same. And it's my hope that an authority can be found in East Berlin to sponsor visits from young people of the Western sectors.
One final proposal, one close to my heart. Sport represents a source of enjoyment and ennoblement. And you may have noted that the Republic of Korea, South Korea, has offered to permit certain events of the 1988 Olympics to take place in the North. International sports competitions of all kinds could take place in both parts of this city. And what better way to demonstrate to the world the openness of this city than to offer in some future year to hold the Olympic Games here in Berlin, East and West. In these four decades, as I have said, you Berliners have built a great city. You've done so in spite of threats, the Soviet attempts to impose the East Mark, the blockade. Today, the city thrives in spite of the challenges implicit in the very presence of this wall. What keeps you here? Certainly, there's a great deal to be said for your fortitude, for your defiant courage, but I believe there's something deeper, something that involves Berlin's whole look and feel and way of life, not mere sentiment. No one could live long in Berlin without being completely disabused of illusions. Something instead that has seen the difficulties of life in Berlin but chose to accept them, that continues to build this good and proud city in contrast to a surrounding totalitarian presence that refuses to release human energies or aspirations. Something that speaks with a powerful voice of affirmation, that says yes to this city, yes to the future, yes to freedom. In a word, I would submit that what keeps you in Berlin is love. Love both profound and abiding. Perhaps this gets to the root of the matter, to the most fundamental distinction of all between East and West. The totalitarian world produces backwardness because it does such violence to the spirit, thwarting the human impulse to create, to enjoy, to worship. The totalitarian world finds even symbols of love and of worship an affront. Years ago, before the East Germans began rebuilding their churches, they erected a secular structure, the television tower at Alexander Platz. Virtually ever since, the authorities have been working to correct what they view as the tower's one major flaw. Treating the glass sphere at the top with paints and chemicals of every kind, yet even today, when the sun strikes that sphere, that sphere that towers over all Berlin, the light makes the sign of the cross. There in Berlin, like the city itself, symbols of love, symbols of worship, cannot be suppressed. As I looked out a moment ago from the Reichstag, that embodiment of German unity, I noticed words crudely spray painted upon the wall, perhaps by a young Berliner. Quote, this wall will fall, beliefs become reality. Yes, across Europe this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith, it cannot withstand truth. The wall cannot withstand freedom. And I would like, before I close, to say one word. I have read and I have been questioned since I've been here about certain demonstrations against my coming. And I would like to say just one thing and to those who demonstrate so. I wonder if they have ever asked themselves that if they should have the kind of government they apparently seek, 
no one would ever be able to do what they're doing again. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Governor, are you prepared to take the constitutional oath? I am. If you place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me, I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Tuesday, January 20th, 1981, Ronald Reagan became the 40th President of the United States. He was sworn in on the terrace of the west front of the Capitol on a day when American hostages in Iran were finally freed after 444 days in captivity. So help me God. Now, I congratulate you, sir. My fellow countrymen, the President of the United States. Reagan then delivered his first inaugural address, declaring government was not the solution to the nation's problems. The Reagan era had officially begun. Thank you. Senator Hatfield, Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. President, Vice President Bush, Vice President Mondale, Senator Baker, Speaker O'Neill, Reverend Mumaw, and my fellow citizens. To a few of us here today, this is a solemn and most momentous occasion. And yet in the history of our nation, it is a commonplace occurrence. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution routinely takes place as it has for almost two centuries and few of us stop to think how unique we really are. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. Mr. President, I want our fellow citizens to know how much you did to carry on this tradition. By your gracious cooperation in the transition process, you have shown a watching world that we are a united people pledged to maintaining a political system which guarantees individual liberty to a greater degree than any other. And I thank you and your people for all your help in maintaining the continuity which is the bulwark of our republic. The business of our nation goes forward. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. It distorts our economic decisions, penalizes thrift, and crushes the struggling young and the fixed income elderly alike. It threatens to shatter the lives of millions of our people. Idle industries have cast workers into unemployment, human misery, and personal indignity. Those who do work are denied a fair return for their labor by a tax system which penalizes successful achievement and keeps us from maintaining full productivity. But great as our tax burden is, it has not kept pace with public spending. For decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. To continue this long trend is to guarantee tremendous social, cultural, political, and economic upheavals. You and I, as individuals, can, by borrowing, live beyond our means, but for only a limited period of time. Why, then, should we think that collectively, as a nation, 
we're not bound by that same limitation. We must act today in order to preserve tomorrow. And let there be no misunderstanding. We are going to begin to act beginning today. The economic ills we suffer have come upon us over several decades. They will not go away in days, weeks, or months, but they will go away. They will go away because we, as Americans, have the capacity now, as we've had in the past, to do whatever needs to be done to preserve this last and greatest bastion of freedom. In this present crisis, Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. Well, if no one among us is capable of governing himself, then who among us has the capacity to govern someone else? All of us together, in and out of government, must bear the burden. The solutions we seek must be equitable with no one group singled out to pay a higher price. We hear much of special interest groups. Well, our concern must be for a special interest group that has been too long neglected. It knows no sectional boundaries or ethnic and racial divisions, and it crosses political party lines. It is made up of men and women who raise our food, patrol our streets, man our mines and factories, teach our children, keep our homes, and heal us when we're sick. Professionals, industrialists, shopkeepers, clerks, cabbies, and truck drivers. They are, in short, we the people. This breed called Americans. Well, this administration's objective will be a healthy, vigorous, growing economy that provides equal opportunities for all Americans with no barriers born of bigotry or discrimination. Putting America back to work means putting all Americans back to work. Ending inflation means freeing all Americans from the terror of runaway living costs. All must share in the productive work of this new beginning, and all must share in the bounty of a revived economy. With the idealism and fair play which are the core of our system and our strength, we can have a strong and prosperous America at peace with itself and the world. So as we begin, let us take inventory. We are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth. Our government has no power except that granted it by the people. It is time to check and reverse the growth of government, which shows signs of having grown beyond the consent of the governed. It is my intention to curb the size and influence of the federal establishment and to demand recognition of the distinction between the powers granted to the federal government and those reserved to the states or to the people. All of us, all of us need to be reminded that the federal government did not create the states. The states created the federal government. Now, so there will be no misunderstanding, it's not my intention to do away with government. It is rather to make it work. Work with us, not over us. To stand by our side, not ride on our back. Government can and must provide opportunity, not smother it. Foster productivity, not stifle it. If we look to the answer, as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, 
It was because here in this land, we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. It is no coincidence that our present troubles parallel and are proportionate to the intervention and intrusion in our lives that result from unnecessary and excessive growth of government. It is time for us to realize that we are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. We are not, as some would have us believe, doomed to an inevitable decline. I do not believe in a fate that will fall on us no matter what we do. I do believe in a fate that will fall on us if we do nothing. So with all the creative energy at our command, let us begin an era of national renewal. Let us renew our determination, our courage, and our strength. And let us renew our faith and our hope. We have every right to dream heroic dreams. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. You can see heroes every day going in and out of factory gates. Others, a handful in number, produce enough food to feed all of us and then the world beyond. You meet heroes across a counter and they're on both sides of that counter. There are entrepreneurs with faith in themselves and faith in an idea who create new jobs, new wealth and opportunity. There are individuals and families who take taxes, support the government, and whose voluntary gifts support church, charity, culture, art, and education. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. Now, I have used the words they and their in speaking of these heroes. I could say you and your because I'm addressing the heroes of whom I speak, you the citizens of this blessed land. Your dreams, your hopes, your goals are going to be the dreams, the hopes, and the goals of this administration, so help me God. We shall reflect the compassion that is so much a part of your makeup. How can we love our country and not love our countrymen? And loving them, reach out a hand when they fall, heal them when they're sick, and provide opportunity to make themselves sufficient so they will be equal in fact and not just in theory. Can we solve the problems confronting us? Well, the answer is an unequivocal and emphatic Yes. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, I did not take the oath I've just taken with the intention of presiding over the dissolution of the world's strongest economy. In the days ahead, I will propose removing the roadblocks that have slowed our economy and reduced productivity. Steps will be taken aimed at restoring the balance between the various levels of government. Progress may be slow, measured in inches and feet, not miles, but we will progress. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant, to get government back within its means, and to lighten our punitive tax burden. And these will be our first priorities, and on these principles there will be no compromise. On the eve of our struggle for independence, a man who might have been one of the greatest among the founding fathers, Dr. Joseph Warren, president of the Massachusetts Congress, said to his fellow Americans, our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. On you depend the fortunes of America. 
You are to decide the important question which, upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. Well, I believe we, the Americans of today, are ready to act worthy of ourselves. Ready to do what must be done to ensure happiness and liberty for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. And as we renew ourselves here in our own land, we will be seen as having greater strength throughout the world. We will again be the exemplar of freedom and a beacon of hope for those who do not now have freedom. To those neighbors and allies who share our freedom, we will strengthen our historic ties and assure them of our support and firm commitment. We will match loyalty with loyalty. We will strive for mutually beneficial relations. We will not use our friendship to impose on their sovereignty, for our own sovereignty is not for sale. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. Our forbearance should never be misunderstood. Our reluctance for conflict should not be misjudged as a failure of will. When action is required to preserve our national security, we will act. We will maintain sufficient strength to prevail if need be, knowing that if we do so, we have the best chance of never having to use that strength. Above all, we must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. I'm I'm told that tens of thousands of prayer meetings are being held on this day. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. It would be fitting and good, I think, if on each inaugural day in future years, it should be declared a day of prayer. This is the first time in our history that this ceremony has been held, as you've been told, on this west front of the Capitol. Standing here, one faces a magnificent vista, opening up on this city's special beauty and history. At the end of this open mall are those shrines to the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Directly in front of me, the monument to a monumental man, George Washington, father of our country, a man of humility who came to greatness reluctantly. He led America out of revolutionary victory into infant nationhood. Off to one side, the stately memorial to Thomas Jefferson, a declaration of independence flames with his eloquence. And then beyond the reflecting pool, the dignified columns of the Lincoln Memorial. Whoever would understand in his heart the meaning of America will find it in the life of Abraham Lincoln. Beyond those moment, those monuments to heroism is the Potomac River and on the far shore, the sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bellow Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Porkchop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, 
and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. The crisis we are facing today does not require of us the kind of sacrifice that Martin Treptow and so many thousands of others were called upon to make. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much. For General Electric, here is Ronald Reagan. Good evening. From 1954 to 1962, actor Ronald Reagan hosted the TV drama series General Electric Theater, sponsored by the company that now owns NBC Universal. We got trouble. Reagan sometimes starred in an episode too, along with hosting. Here is one of those, broadcast on February 3rd, 1957. Good evening. Tonight it is my pleasure to appear with John Erickson on the General Electric Theater. Later, you will see a progress report that shows how General Electric is helping to increase our national productivity, the key to our high level of living. Another reason why we say, at General Electric, progress is our most important problem. Good evening. All right, that's enough. This story takes place in the punchy 30s, which some of you may remember followed the frenzied 20s. It was the golden era of pugilism. Club fighters fought like champs, and champs were national heroes. And some were neither. Me, I hung up my gloves. It was no skin off me. I have just been signed as a trainer by Jasper Jones, my old boss. A very sharp manager who owns a piece of this and a piece of that. But mainly now owns this new sensational heavyweight wonder boy Nick, who's also an ex-college football player. As for me, for very good money, I am hired to condition this boy way up to the world title. All right, now keep that left in his face. Forcing the action again. He throws two ripping rights to the head. Goes back with a left to the body, a right to the body, and a hard left to the jaw. Crosso is really taking a terrific beat. Up against the ropes now. Nick throws a short left jab, crosses with a hard right, and Crosso goes down. Jubilation reigns supreme in Nick's corner right above us here. That's all there is to it. Two minutes, 12 seconds of the fourth round. Winner by a knockout, Wonder Boy Nick. You know, that makes his 11th straight victory in all by KOs. And that makes him the seventh ranking heavyweight in the world. This young college kid is really a crowd pleaser. 
And who knows, someday under Jasper Jones' management, he may wind up taking the crown away from the champion. Well, that's all there is here at ringside. We return you now to our main studio. Boy, I sure polished him off. And neat, too. I'd like to see a good mechanic in the ring. I was hoping they'd stop it in the third. Well, the fourth was better. I mean, it gave the fans more fight. Hey, did I pull off that one, too, the way you showed me? Sure. I move you to the head of the class. Good. Anything else you want to teach me, just show me. Remember, I went to college. I pick up fast. You sure do. All right, boy. End of the shower. Well, your boy won. Your boy won. Well, you trained him, Farmer, and he won. Why don't you look happy? There's enough actors around the kid without me. Especially that fatso grazzo. What an actor. He should be in the moving pictures. What do you mean by that, Craig? One of those water spectacles. Like a trained seal, he takes such a beautiful dive. Why don't you stop blowing through that hole in your head? Maybe grasso don't want to wind up selling pencils or washing windows. Maybe. Ah, your punchy from all those lumps you took. Yeah, I always protected my eyes. I can still see. Then you saw our boy knock out Grasso. I saw our boy flick Grasso's whiskers with a right that was about as tough as a barber's brush. Now look, Farmer. I'm paying you to train and handle Wonder Boy Nick. Good money, too. And a nibble off the purses as soon as we begin hitting the real paydays. This is the softest touch you ever had. It's soft, all right. And plenty ripe. If I want editorials, I can buy them for a dime from those sorehead sports writers. Sure. But if you don't want the job, if you'd rather wash okay, windows... Okay, okay. It's no skin off me. Wonder Boy Nick, superbly conditioned by that old contender, Farmer Watson, knocked out Jeff Grazzo in four rounds tonight. The final punch nearly tore his head off. That's more like it. And that's the way it's got to stay or I get me a new trainer. Okay. Now light up that baboon pussy of yours with a smile, because here comes my boy. Go ahead, Farmer. Teach him plenty. Pretty soon we'll move in at the top, right to the title. Well, that sounds just great. Don't forget, two weeks from tonight you fight Benny Lamar in Chicago. That means you still got to keep in shape. You go to one movie with a girlfriend and report every day and every night to Farmer. Now I got to leave you, boys. Remember, Farmer, he's in your hands. Oh, uh, need a few? Yeah, I kind of overdrew. Take this. You still get your share of the purse. All my fighters get an honest count. Right, Farmer? That's right. Even when the expenses ate up the purse. An honest count. Huh. Yeah, that's just what we need around here. A good clown. <laughs> He's a great character, that Jasper. Yeah, great. The way he snaps those orders, huh? Well, he's the boss. He owns you. Well, that's a funny way to put it. It's the only way. He used to own me. Fighter's a commodity, like a side of beef. It's up to each manager to make his commodities so scarce and attractive. Fans will pay a million bucks to see him in action. A million bucks. Of course, I never had what you got. Well, yet you got to be a contender. I didn't have it. No color, no title shot. That's what Jasper promised me, the title. A quick million, if I do what he says. Well, and that's all there is to it. Except, of course, you got to take the title away from the champ. And I will someday. Jasper says so. With you training me the way I learn fast, Jasper, my manager, someday... Someday. Jasper says I got a great chance. And who knows better than Jasper? Hi, baby. Oh, Nick, darling. You all right? You aren't hurt? Oh, then you saw the fight, huh? I closed my eyes a couple of times. It's pretty brutal. But you were wonderful. I guess I was. Ask the farmer. <laughs> it's like Jasper says, Mary. All the world loves a champ. I watched the way you took care of him between rounds. It's wonderful the way you rub his neck and sweet talk him. Uh, a good trainer is sort of like a nursemaid. What do you tell him? Mainly to keep off the canvas. He, he didn't get hurt, did he? How could he get hurt? I mean, he's in condition, young. I know now with you in his corner, he's in great hands. Thanks, Mary. 
Come on, Farmer, have a drink with us. A soft drink. I want to relax. Tonight we're at a victory. I'm entitled to celebrate. They sure look good together. Mary would have looked good with anybody, even me. They were youngsters that knew dancing and fun and music from parties and school. Things I knew nothing about. But that girl had more than looks. She had know-how, character, and loyalty. And certainly more brains than the boy she was in love with. I couldn't help dreaming. Suppose I'd been in Nick's place. Come on, Farmer, you've neglected me all evening, so I'm asking you to finish. A dance? Yes, it's your party, too. It sure be my guest. Oh, I always fought flat-foot at a dance the same way. <laughs> oh, now, Farmer, you mustn't hurt Mary's feelings. Yeah, but I'm saving her feet. Dance, this is an order. You see, you're getting along fine. I got a pretty good teacher. <laughs> From what I hear, you're a pretty good teacher yourself. The best in the country. Well, a little bit I picked up the hard way. I want Nick to know everything, so he can protect himself. You really crazy about this guy? <laughs> I guess that's pretty clear. It's as simple and final as three short words. I love him. Guess I'm pretty dumb. I shouldn't have had to ask. You're not dumb, Farmer. You must have had a reason. Tell me. You know, I not only love him, I worry about him. Do you like having him in this racket? That's what he wants. He's chasing the dream. He thinks he can overtake it. How can I stop him? He's the man. He makes the decision. Let's get an old-fashioned wall. You still haven't answered my question. Do you want him in this racket? How do you vote? You do believe he can get to the top. I don't know, Mary. It's a long haul. Got to take a lot of lumps on the way. Right now, he's good-looking, got all his marbles. Ten fights from now, even if Jasper hand picks every opponent, he ain't gonna be the same. He ain't gonna look the same. I suppose you're right. I get nightmares thinking about that. Well, don't worry about it too much. Even if the house falls on him, he won't look as bad as I do. Farmer, what are Nick's chances? For what? The title. Well, like we said, he's got a good build. He's a college athlete, six feet two. The toy bulldog was short and fought at 155 pounds. He killed Giant. He's a conscientious trainer. He's always in sharp condition. Harry Grab never bothered to train, and he always did all right. Hey, where'd you pick up all this dope? Remember, I love Nick. If fighting's his career, I've got to know all about it. But first, I've got to know about his chances. He's in good hands. They don't come any sharper than Jasper. He says... That... I know. He told Nick there was a quick million for the man who could beat the champ. That's why Nick went into it. That's why I couldn't stop him if I tried. Then don't. But do you think he has chance? Mary, I only train him. With the gym shoes and the liniment and the bandages and all the regulation equipment, I do not also carry a crystal ball. I couldn't sleep that night, so I spent a couple of hours with my scrapbook, the calendar of lumps, I call it. I think of all the beatings I took and gave and how quick the buzzards picked my purses clean. I'm also thinking of Mary and Nick, mainly of Mary. And I know if I'd been lucky enough to have a girl like that love me, I would have done anything to keep her from worry. Most fighters are lonely guys. In the ring, they're alone. When they win, they can buy trainers, sparring partners, court jesters. But when they start to slip and the purses get lean, the friends fall away like leaves off a dead limb. How lucky that Nick had a girl like Mary. That's why I couldn't sleep. For sooner or later, if I wanted to face her, I might have to tell her the truth about Wonder Boy.
That was Act One of No Skin Off Me, starring Ronald Reagan and John Erickson. Now, General Electric Progress reporter Don Herbert shows us how in the old days, the lights in your home depended on a man with good lung power. Do you know what that man's doing, Carol? Is he blowing up a balloon or something? Well, he's making the glass bulb for an electric light. See, that's the way it was done back in 1890, not long after Thomas Edison invented the electric light. Gee, looks like it's awfully hard to do. And slow, too. Back in those days, a worker could turn out about 200 light bulbs a day. But in 1919, when machines like this were used, a worker could turn out oh, about 2,000 light bulbs a day. And he didn't have to work so hard, did he? That's right. Now, let's move up to the present. Today, at General Electric, with modern machines, one workman can produce 10,000 light bulbs in a single day. Golly, Mr. Herbert, we've made a lot of progress. In more ways than one, Carol. Because the American worker can produce more, as a customer, he can buy more. He can? Well, here, let me show you. Back in 1890, when we were first beginning to use electric light, the cost of just one light bulb represented about four hours' earnings for the average American industrial worker. Now, remember that. Four hours of work. Right. Now, the American worker today can buy a vastly improved light bulb for only about six minutes' work. Four hours in 1890. Six minutes today. Golly, think how many more bulbs he can buy today. And, of course, he only buys as many as he needs, and then he can buy so many other things. You see, as more goods and services are produced, they become available to everybody. And that's what we mean by a high level of living. Oh, I see. When we produce more, we live better. Yes. Now, one of the main reasons for our greater productivity is the fact that we found so many new machines to use electric power. You mean electricity? Mm-hmm. For example, this is the worker of 1890. Let's say this represents what he could do in an hour. Now, by comparison, today's worker, with the help of electricity, can do four times as much work in an hour. And if we want our level of living to go even higher, we've got to produce even more goods. I guess we'll just have to find better ways to do our work. Mm -hmm. That's why companies, like General Electric, are so interested in research and development. Won't that cost a lot of money, Mr. Herbert? Well, yes, it will. And, Carol, where do you suppose that money will come from? Well, it'll come from the savings and earnings of the people who own American industry. Well, they're called share owners. Well, what have we learned about our American level of living? Well, our level of living depends pretty much on how much each of us can produce. And the more we produce, the higher our level of living. That's right, Carol. Productivity is the key to progress. And at General Electric, progress is our most important product. in a bowling alley. But the big question now is, can he make it number 16? Time will tell. Well, that's all from ringside. Thanks very much for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Good night. You're staring at me. Nothing. Well, quit it. You're driving me crazy. There's Jasper. I'll bring him over.
Gracie's eye. Close up. I had to press a silver dollar against it to cut the swelling. Don't worry about his eye. Even a great fighter like Nick's got to collect a few shiners. I'm not so much worried about that. I'm afraid for Nick. Why, he's going great. He's got dynamite in each fist. He changed. Are you worried about the swelled eye or a swelled head? Farmer, look. N Nick was a sweet boy. Oh, a little conceited like a kid athlete, but, but really good and considerate. And now he's changed, and it's not his fault. Farmer, does Nick know what's really happening? What do you mean, what's really happening? Farmer, don't try to fool me. Nick's been getting an awful lot of cooperation in these knockouts. Maybe that eye wasn't in the script. Maybe he just couldn't get out of the way. Someday, when there's no script, Nick's going to get killed. Doesn't he realize that? Nick thinks it's all on the up and up. He thinks he's got a stranglehold on that title already. Well, we've got to tell him. You think he'll believe you? Look at him. Laughing up the glamour and publicity. The sucker's the last one to believe it. He's Mr. Big now. You, you could talk to Jasper. Jasper? He blueprinted this. Blueprinted Nick all the way to a title shot. This is his baby. Doesn't he realize that when that bubble breaks, it's going to kill Nick? And he doesn't care. Even the loser's end of a million dollar gate will buy a lot of cookies. Especially if you know the right way to bet it. Farmer, please tell him. Look, Mary. I had 132 fights in 10 years. All I got to show for it's a beat up face and a few clippings. Now I'm eating regular. Paying the rent, got folding money in my pocket. I feel safe and I like it that way. Jasper's got a big magazine writer with him. He's gonna do an article on me. He's gonna bring him around later to set up a time for the interview. I told you to stop looking at me like I was a freak. Sorry, Nick. It's just the eye. Look, if it doesn't bother me, why should it bother you? She can't help it, Nick. Every time you get hit, she feels a double. Now, what are you, some kind of a philosopher? You just train me and keep out of my private life. Maybe if I was conditioned right, nobody would lay a glove on me. Now, well, Nick... After I get the title, you'll horn in on the reputation of training a champ. Well, that's pretty good for a has-been, an old club fighter. Stop it, Nick. It's not only your eye. It's the way you've changed. The way you snap at people, the way nobody can talk to you fill the whole looking glass. There's no room for anybody else. Oh, give it up before you become completely brutalized. Look, will you knock off the lectures? You'll forget about the brutal part once you're married to me and help me spend my milk. Oh, you know I don't want a penny of that. Dry up? What's this writer guy gonna think if he sees my girl crying? Can I get this through your head? This isn't penny any stuff. This is a big national magazine. The whole country's gonna see the spread. A day in the life of a contender, he's gonna call it. You know what I told him? He doesn't have to wait long. He can write another. A day in the life of a champ. Well, what do you want? You biting into next week's paycheck? No. I want you to let the Wonder Boy off the hook. Oh, you're just bringing me a laugh. Let Nick off. I finally get the hottest contender in the division. A crowd pleaser. A college athlete. What college? Well, who cares what college? What do you want to do, see his diploma? Look, why don't you let the kid off? For his own good, maybe even for the good of the game. Just once, Jasper, chalk up a right thing. Now, yeah, cut out the fiddle music. Since when do you go in for hearts and flowers? Instead of making me cry, teach the boy how to tie a man up in a clinch, how to protect himself from a butt, how to keep a thumb out of his eye. You used to get by on a left hook and an iron cage for his stomach. Well, work on the kid's left and on his stomach muscles. Well, you may be right. I may have a little trouble with this next guy he fights. 
This one don't care too much for the drink. Even if he finds two G's at the end of the dive. You mean Nick might really have to fight this one? Yeah. He may have to fight. If you don't want the job of training okay. him... Okay. For this, I'll train him. Now ah, you're talking like one of the family. Oh, by the way, Farmer, don't forget that magazine guy's coming up to do that article. You'll have to take care of him, because I'll be out of town. Hey, there's a tie for a present. Cost me 15 bucks. Thanks. It's too rich for my blood. If I wore that, honest people might think I was a fight manager. But I learned that what Jasper had told me was not so. The fix was in, Nick would win again, only to be faced with a bigger beating and a bigger heartbreak when he finally met the title test. Of course, all the time I was thinking of Mary. The way he snapped at her, the way she looked at me, and I wouldn't help. And today, I knew I had to do it. One, two, pull it. That's it. Well, we get some wonderful shots of the road work, Nick punching the bag and skipping the rope. As a finale, we'll let him kiss his girl. But first, we got to get a couple of good action pictures of Nick boxing. You'll get them. Farmer, get Joe. Joe's my sparring partner. He used to be fourth ranking contender about five years ago. Well, where is he? Well, Nick, you hit him so hard yesterday, he didn't come back. I did, huh? Well, well, look, we got to get somebody. Well, Jasper's away, and you know how he is about authority. I didn't want to take it on myself to hire somebody. Oh, wait a minute. We can't let Mr. Dugan down on the magazine. My fans, they want to spread on me. He came all the way down here for a layout. Well, I know. That's why I thought maybe just for the pictures, I'd put on the gloves and go a couple of rounds with you. Now, what do you mean, you? You're in no condition. You haven't fought in eight years. Nick, You're too darling, stuck. he's only trying to now, help. What are you butting in for? You could take it easy with me, Nick. You don't have to cut me up. Just don't sink any of your famous haymakers in my midsection. I can stay long enough for the boys to get some good shots of you pounding away. Okay. I'll take it easy on them and you'll get your pictures. Fine. Uh, you got a pair of trunks, Farmer? So happens I have. The last time I wore them was when I fought Sailor Romay. What a pasting I took. Well, it may take a minute. I might have to let him out. I'll make it snappy, Farmer. Come on, Farmer, hurry up. Let's go. Come on. Go over there in the corner and get some good shots. Ready? I took his lead in the mouth, a long left hand, and I slipped inside with both hands to his body. I turned him around and belted him quick with a right. He looked surprised. Then I hit him a few more shots inside. Before he could get set, I drove him to the ropes and pinned him there. I gave him what none of his opponents gave him. Wonder Boy began to turn sick. He came back at me madder than I've ever seen him. He knew what I was up to, and he also realized that this was a fight for his reputation, his very life. I'll say one thing for the boy. He wasn't yellow. He stabbed straight and sharp with that left hand, sliced my lips inside my mouth. But I had to finish this job. I went after him and nearly broke him in half with a body hook. His face went white. I caught him coming off the ropes, and I pulled the trigger on my right hand. It exploded off my chest, and I saw the curtain come over Nicky's eyes. He'd never been hit like that before. This makes an even better story. We just changed the title. The last day in the life of a contender. Come on, big boy. Come on. I'm sorry, Mary. It's the only way I knew to do it. It hurt him. It hurt me. I didn't enjoy it too much myself. But I think it worked. Better now than later. He lost to you. But from the way I look at it, he won. Thank you. playing Farmer Watson, working with John Erickson, Judith Ames, and the rest of our cast. Our thanks to all of them. Next week, the General Electric Theater is proud to present James Stewart.
Jimmy, I think, is one of the all-time greats of the American screen, and his only other dramatic appearance on television was also in our series. Ladies and gentlemen, about 160,000 Hungarian refugees have reached safety in Austria. More are expected to come. These people need food, clothes, medicine, and shelter. You can help. Send your contribution to the American Red Cross, CARE, or the church or synagogue of your choice. Until next week, then, good night for General Electric, where progress in products goes hand in hand with providing progress in the human values that enrich the lives of us all. That's why, at General Electric, progress is our most important product. <laughs>